scope do not try and remove them inside the scope otherwise you will lose them and always repeat or check scopy to make sure that there are no remnants or secretions or plugs or any multiple foreign bodies important thing with the rigid scope is that you can use a lipidoscope to straighten the angle of the foreign body create a space if there is no space in the foreign body and also as a shield if it is a sharp foreign body so this is some a patient who had uh, this cap which was not coming out and eventually what was needed was this hooked forcep which was borrowed from the urology hygroscopic foreign bodies these are very very difficult as you can see peanuts chanas they just swell up and they create a lot of trouble they usually also cause a lot of granulation and if left in for very long can also result in stenosis which needs to be managed later so these are some examples of what you can see this is a child who had a history of uh, aspiration of a piece of almond you can see that the rigid scope is in place and you can see this foreign body in the right main bronchus now the telescope has been loaded on the grasping forceps and we are going back in make sure that you grasp it at the right angle otherwise you will lose it again if it's slippery try and grasp it more distally than proximally otherwise again it, you may land up losing it when you're coming out complications of the procedure itself to remember again as we've this been discussing again and again uh, laryngospasm bronchospasm subglottic edema if you've used an over size scope or there is too much manipulation or trauma during extraction of the foreign body look remember that you must not uh, remember that keep a watch on the saturation and if there is any mucosal bleeding you need to handle it pneumothorax pneumomediastinum in children can happen if the patient is being over ventilated when there is a unilateral obstruction so please remember to tell your anesthetist to keep a watch out for that as well take home messages preventive education for children is important high index of suspicion because sometimes in organic foreign bodies you will not be able to see a foreign body on the x-ray and in adults they may present many many years later always do a scopy when you have a doubt like you have a non resolving pneumonia a long standing bronchic tests or some past history of aspiration teamwork between anesthetists sometimes you may need the ent surgeon and your pediatrician and radiology friends make sure you have a well equipped setup and it's a life saving procedure and often the only one especially in children thank you Oh, what a lucid and wonderful actor! Uh, if there are any questions, and I'm quite excited because I am a pediatrician, and we keep on coming uh, such instances every now and then. And uh, a number of instances, you know, it is a treat from the elder sib to the younger one who still doesn't have any teeth. He's just six months or say less, and that older sib of two years tried to feed him with popcorn and nuts and what not. And you know, then you suddenly find the child has started coughing. and the mother is quite anxious to bring me the child saying i left my baby with this elder one and now he is like he was perfectly all right and that's what makes the case for foreign body so uh, wonderful and besides that of course as she said that when we get a case of a non resolving pneumonia or a localized wheeze or a hemoptysis uh, we should think of a forgotten uh, inhaled foreign body and with that if there are any questions i think she will be happy to answer that So I don't think there are any questions. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And I mean, of course, I knew there can't be many questions because she's so well elaborated everything. And with that, I pass on to. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Jamalul Aziz. He is consultant pulmonologist at Southern Hospital of Malaysia. He need no introduction. again so i think i'm going to give uh, back to back uh, talk for the next 
See there the background color there, okay? And uh, the title, the role of bronchoscopy in bracket rigid in the diagnosis and management of severe massive hemoptosis. Sometimes you just wonder how this guy can remain calm with that uh, background there, when he is uh, drowning in in blood there. Okay, so let's see. <coughs> So basically, when we, when we talk about um, massive hemoptysis, uh, we're not uh, talking about a single magic bullet. Basically, it's a firing squad, it's a teamwork. So I, I'm going to go through all this, uh, the content from introduction to conclusion. So not to worry, do not need, uh, you don't have to jot down uh, any notes. Uh, the slides are with Professor Shamim, and so you can uh, just uh, listen to, to the talk. So, massive hemoptysis uh, uh, is, uh, to be honest, I'm not the best person eh, to give a talk on massive hemoptysis because I don't handle this on a regular basis. You know. Can, uh, I think very few people in the world really handle massive hemoptysis on a regular basis, I suspect, because uh, it is rare. Although, and although it is rare, uh, it is life-threatening. And sometimes when we encounter a case of massive hemoptysis, everything is done spontaneous, spontaneously. And we just do what, you know, uh, manage with whatever we have. So let's see um, what the evidence says. Okay, so basically, um, after we have handled um, the issues uh, with regard to the airway protection and volume resuscitation, then we go to the, to the next step, which is bronchoscopy, um, to localize the, the site of the bleeding, to isolate, the, the, the affected airway, control the hemorrhage, and, the, and to treat in case you, you come across any visible endoluminal lesion. So basically, there's, and so as the, the, the definition of massive hemoptysis, basically no clear, there's no consensus. And so we can go all the way down from massive uh, to major, severe, exsanguinating, life-threatening, okay, but there is no consensus. And I think that's why we are talking about the mag magnitude of effect rather than um, um, the definition of massive hemoptysis. Uh, so, um, and simply because of, of this reason, uh, because of the arbitrary use of the criteria, no consensus in terms of uh, the definition, and then um, um, you have to look at the patient factor the ability to maintain patent airway and cardiopulmonary comorbidities. So this, this, this is what we mean by magnitude of effects. So the amount doesn't really matter, but the magnitude of effects uh, matters. Okay. So we, we, we have to look at, regardless of the amount of bleeding, hemoptysis, these are the things uh, the, uh, that are important. Okay. Um, whether there is airway obstruction, Hemodynamic instability, where the patient needs transfusion, need to be uh, hospitalized, intubation, uh, aspiration to the contralateral side, hypoxemia, and death. So these are more important than the, the, uh, any definition of massive hemoptysis. Okay, a bit of an anatomy recall. Um, so basically, the 90% majority of uh, massive hemoptysis originate from the bronchial circulation full stop okay and uh, and the rest you can read so um, I almost myself forgot where the bronchial arteries originated from so basically they originate from the descending aorta okay I think um, it's much easier to understand bronchial arteries arise from the descending aorta okay and this is the main culprit huh? in massive hemoptysis, 90% of the cases. Okay, so anyway, most common causes of massive hemoptysis are bronchiectasis, TB, these are common. I think in India, in Malaysia as well, mycetoma, necrotizing pneumonia, and bronchogenic carcinoma, these are common in, uh, in this part of the world. Okay, 
okay? And um, you want to look at precise data in, in several countries, in South Africa, most common cause is TB, so nothing unusual about that. What about in Singapore? Okay, uh, Malaysia is just above Singapore there. Okay, and so I think the causes are almost the same. Bronchiac disease, mycetoma, TB, active TB, tumor, and diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Yeah? And then what about in China? Again, same uh, cause, uh, the same condition crop up. Yeah? Bronchiac disease, TB, mycetoma, it's just in the order of number one, number two, number three, and so on. Yeah? But you know, basically, TB, bronchiac disease, yeah? uh, and lung cancer, mycetoma are the common ones. You know? So what do we know? Uh, at this stage, a life-threatening massive of this still is a, only account for uh, the you know for a minority of the of the cases and only five to fifteen percent um, happen in twenty percent of cases lung cancer. Okay, and uh, in um, the U.S. Uh, sixty fibrosis registry um, uh, showed that you know four point one percent of their patients with cystic fibrosis and develop. Uh, massive hemoptysis and, and that the mortality is higher depending on the rate of bleeding. Okay. Prognostic, prognostic features and uh, poor uh, what are the features that indicate poor prognosis? Okay. So if, if the rate is higher, more than one liter in over 24 hours, there is aspiration of blood. Uh, if the patient needs single lung ventilation, then uh, of course bronchogenic carcinoma. So these are poor prognostic uh, indicators and better uh, prognosis in patients with TB, bronchitis, and bronchitis. So what are the risk factors for recurrence? Uh, so in the literature it's stated these are the three, three main risk factors. If there is residual bleeding beyond the first week of bronchial artery embolization if the patient needs blood transfusion for procedure and if it's a case of aspergilloma. Okay. Diagnosis. So um, this has to be undertaken. So, what what is the uh, cause of the massive hemoptysis? This has to be undertaken eh? after we have uh, taken care of the airway and the hemodynamic status. Eh? Okay, obviously it's difficult to do bronchoscopy in patient who is unstable. Eh? And chest X-ray may be able to identify the site in up to 80% of the cases. And if chest X-ray is normal, bronchiectasis could be the cause. And, and a CT as well, okay. And and CT scan um, uh, may be able to uh, identify uh, extra pulmonary cause of hemoptysis, and that may obviate the need for bronchial arteriogram. Mm -hmm. Some suggest CT may be able to replace uh, fiber optic uh, bronchoscopy. I'm not sure about that, but I I, I think in my personal opinion, uh, CT uh, is complementary to flexible. Uh, to fiber of the bronchoscopy, okay, and then the role of multi detector CT scan. Uh, you can read this, okay, and so what about the role of flexible uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy? Eh? So um, whether you like it or not, you, you you know whatever they say that you know CT scan can uh, multi detector CT scan uh, can detect the, the cause of uh, of hemoptysis. You still need to proceed with flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy. Eh? So um, and so uh, you know he may be able to fiber optic bronchoscopy may be to uh, may be able to identify site in up to ninety three percent of the cases and then the timing whether uh, you know when to perform uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy is, is controversial uh, whether you should do it early or delayed but. It has been shown that that you know uh, whether you do it early or later, it, it doesn't alter the therapeutic decision or the clinical outcomes in non-massive bleeds. Eh? And um, um, I agree with this statement that we shouldn't rely on the flexible uh, bronchos bron bronchoscopy alone, and bec uh, because really bronchoscopy is far efficient in terms of uh, safe, uh, safeguarding the airway, preserving ventilation allowing better clearance and improving visualization. Okay, the management of massive hemoptysis, you know the bleeding side then, you put the patient in this uh, lateral incubator's position with the bleeding side down, okay? And then uh, if the, the patient is uh, 
compromise and re bronchoscopy should be performed by a skilled physician again not uh, uh, every center has uh, this facility and even if that center has someone skilled uh, in uh, radio bronchoscopy uh, you know uh, the, the the person may not be available may not be on call maybe traveling abroad etc etc so somebody has to to manage the, the patient okay so if no rigid bronchoscopy is available or the rigid bronchoscopy is not around Okay, then somebody has to do uh, something, okay, intubate the patient uh, with endotracheal tube. Um, the larger, the better, and, um, and, uh, um, and then to try to uh, um, uh, protect the non-bleeding lung. Double lumen intubation, um, I, I have reservation about this. Eh? Um, so this is uh, uh, double lumen endotracheal tube. You have the tracheal lumen, uh, you have the bronchial lumen, but um, uh, okay, so that this is uh, one slide from CHESS 2015. So basically, um, yeah, in short, yeah, for me, uh, I, I, I would rather avoid uh, a double lumen endotracheal tube in, uh, when I face a patient with uh, massive hemoptysis because um, I just think that it, you know, it, it's just complicated and even, I don't know, even my cardiothoracic anesthetists have difficulty to intubate. Uh, with double lumen and endotracheal tube. The lumens are small, so how are we going to manage massive hemoptysis? I cannot see how. So uh, for me, as far as I'm concerned, I would uh, forget uh, double lumen and endotracheal tube and stick to rigid bronchoscopy. So what about bronchoscopic treatment in, in procedure-induced bleeding? We cause bleeding all the time when we do endobronchial biopsy or transbronchial biopsy. So these are the things that you can do, um, the bronchoscope, kept in, in the wedge position okay, uh, inside the airway and then uh, you try to minimize suctioning okay, and you do biopsies in dependent areas and suction applied only at a certain distance and if vision is obscured the scope should be rubbed against the cartilage wall but I think the one I underline here my practice nowadays whether I perform endobronchial biopsy or transbronchial cryolung biopsy I have endobronchial blocker Okay. And if I anticipate bleeding, massive bleeding, if the lesion looks vascular, even doing endobronchial biopsy, I'll have endobronchial blocker, okay. prophylactically. So what about radio bronchoscopy in massive hemoptysis? Very useful. Um, you heard uh, uh, about uh, you, you heard the talk about radio bronchoscopy. Um, so um, basically, you know, if, yeah, I think it's just a, a very important tool uh, in the in the management of massive hemoptysis. Okay, so so it has a large working channel. You can uh, in, in, insert uh, uh, you know many uh, uh, many tools at the same time: laser, electrocautery, APC, cryo, uh, and, and you can do suctioning as well. So does this mean that rigidoscope should be available in every bronchoscopy suite? Obviously the answer is no, it's just not possible. Okay, because you're talking about facilities, equipment, the training, and then so everybody start doing rigid bronchoscopy then, you know, um, then you don't get the, the, the volume for your center and then you cannot maintain the skill. So should it be, uh, so that is the, the first question that I said no. Should it be included, the next question, should it, should it be included into respiratory fellowship program? Yes, I think, uh, in my opinion. And then even in the US, uh, not everybody does really bronchoscopy in Canada as well. In Malaysia, same, same uh, scenario, not everybody. We have regional centers uh, to perform uh, rigid bronchoscopy. Okay, and then, uh, you know, um, these are the, the problems that when you set up ready bronchoscopy, you need uh, training, um, you need to work well with your anesthesiologists, you don't uh, create enemies with them, okay, and uh, operation theatre, post anesthetic care unit bed, or part of that we call it in, in, in my place, it's always an issue, okay, my anesthetist insists, you know, okay, this patient is a high risk procedure, must have PACU bed, you know, before I can perform radiate bronchoscopy. So, um, it's always an issue uh, for, uh, for, uh, for me. And then you must have effective collaboration with thoracic surgeons. 
and therefore I, I think uh, we, uh, I, I agree that you know not all bronchoscopies need uh, to, to be trained and be proficient in the rigid bronchoscopy. So uh, the last few slides and just going through uh, the various bronchoscopic devices and treatment strategies in the management of massive hemoptysis. Um, so, although you can argue that uh, many of these devices and strategies can be performed via flexible bronchoscope, but um, obviously, you know, by having rigid bronchoscope, uh, you know, you can do uh, all these, um, um, you can manage the patient a lot uh, better. Okay, cold saline, uh, lava, we do this all the time, so there's nothing, uh, nothing new about this. Okay, and then topical vasoconstrictor agents, um, uh, epinephrine, okay, even the antidiuretic hormone derivative. So all this uh, can be used uh, in uh, uh, in mild uh, bleeding, I guess, but not useful in massive bleeding. Okay, tranexamic acid we use this all the time. I use I use this all the time. And then bronchial artery embolization. Okay, so this is before and after embolization. So this, for this, you need to refer your patient. Uh, your center needs to have interventional radiology uh, facilities, obviously. And uh, fortunately, in my center, I do have interventional radiology uh, radiologists uh, to perform uh, bronchial artery embolization. Okay, um, recurrence of hemoptysis post embolization may be may be due to all these things. And pro procedure and complication post BAE. Um, so, yes, the per, this, this is the last one there. Permanent neurological complication could happen okay, because we know that you know the spinal artery, spinal arteries can come from the bronchial arteries. So, um, this could happen. So you have to be, you have to explain to the patient uh, regarding the you know possible complication. And balloon camp nut, I, I use this uh, quite often nowadays. So I'm just showing the the, the strategies that I I usually uh, do in my practice. Okay. And I do this nowadays for endobronchial biopsy and uh, cryolung biopsy. Okay. Just going through quickly. APC as well. Um, um, I also uh, use this. Uh, it's quite uh, useful in. Uh, uh, mild moderate hemoptysis. Okay. okay, now I'm just finishing off uh, with uh, the techniques which I don't do. Okay, so I'm not sure whether you do do you do this in your practice. Uh, fibrinogen thrombin, uh, I, I don't do this uh, in my practice. Uh, you can read the evidence for it. Okay, and uh, endobronchus stand. Um, uh, you know, as the initial management approach. To massive hypothesis, I have not done this myself. Okay, and uh, this is how it, how it is done. So basically, if there's a bleeding there, and you just put a stand there to tampen up, to sort of tampen up the bleeding there. I have not done one case myself. Okay, this is what it looks like. The, there's a bleeding site there, and then you put a metallic stand. And then uh, I think you know uh, Dr. Hervey uh, from Marseille, so he. Uh, Publish a case report use, uh, using a silicon spigot uh, in the management of uh, massive uh, hemoptysis via rigid bron uh, bronchoscope. Okay, and then you have this uh, hemostatic tamponade therapy for life-threatening uh, hemoptysis published by Dr. Archang Valipo. Okay, oh, oh. I don't I don't have any uh, experience in using this, and then I think this. Uh, was published by a group from India, if I'm not mistaken, endobronchial sealing with biocompatible glue. Uh, again, I don't have personal experience in using this. And then finally, laser. Uh, Dr. Dumont uh, proposed this. Basically, uh, you have a, a bleeding a bronchial artery here, and then you use the suction catheter to clear it, and you see and, uh, the bleeding uh, artery here. And then you laser it, you know. Okay, so that work. Um, uh, but uh, I have yet to use my laser to manage a massive hemoptysis. Okay, and uh, some anecdotal anecdotal um, 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 reports 
Watson uh, using electrocautery. Again, I don't have personal experience. Then cryotherapy and even brachytherapy. Uh, I don't know uh, who will be using brachytherapy. Uh, I'm not even uh, able to convince my oncologist uh, uh, to offer brachytherapy in patients with endobronchial uh, tumor. So I don't know how you know uh, we can uh, uh, offer brachytherapy in patients with uh, massive hemoptysis. Surgery, um, I think nowadays it is seldom performed uh, in patients uh, with a massive hemoptysis due to high morbidity and mortality. And then you have nowadays we have a safe endovascular procedure like a bronchial artery embolization, but there may be a role for surgery in certain uh, uh, situations like this. Uh, Cocktail AVM, hydrogenic pulmonary artery rupture, chest trauma, mastitoma, bronchovascular fistula. So in summary, to this, I'll leave you with this algorithm. Uh, you can look at the slide. Um, basically, if you have a case of passive hypothesis, um, you see whether uh, the patient is in respiratory failure or not. Either way, patient goes to the ICU and then rigid bronchoscopy is the first step there. And then you do all the uh, treatment strategies uh, via rigid bronchoscopy. There's no mention about double lumen there, I think. Okay, so I think that's the, the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Prof. Jamalu Lazi. Now, the next lecture is also from the same. The lung volume reduction. The question we will take in the end of the session. is bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. <coughs> Again, uh, uh, no conflict of interest here. Okay, so I'll start with a case scenario. Um, I have uh, this patient, 71 year old Chinese man, ex smoker, 40 pack years, um, COPD gold D, uh, very, very breathless, um, grade four, CT scan shows homogeneous emphysema, Everyone shows very severe um, um, uh, airflow limitation, so only 29% of predicted. Uh, significant air trapping there, reduced uh, gas transfer, reduced uh, significant walk test distance, and uh, had multiple comorbidities. So, what will you do now? Can, can we, can we uh, have some interaction here? Maybe we can ask the junior ones. What, what will you do? You have somebody with basically uh, severe emphysema on on maximum medical therapy. What else can be done? He, so on maximum medical therapy and he is still breathless. What should we do? Okay, number one, refer for hospice care. Anyone? Or add more bronchodilators and oral corticosteroid. Refer for lung transplant assessment. Refer to your friendly surgeons for lung volume reduction surgery. Or refer for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Anyone? D. E. 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 Okay. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, um, just a warning. Do not be swayed by my talk. Okay? By the title of my talk. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> I guess it depends on the expertise and what you have uh, in your in your centers. And, okay, so D is not wrong if you have the expertise. I guess C is also not wrong if the patient is somewhere in Toronto, the biggest lung transplant center in the world. So it depends, I guess. But not it's not necessarily bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so what's the rationale for lung volume reduction for emphysema? So basically, to reduce hyperinflation and, and improve the diaphragmatic function and reduce the work of breathing. And uh, so increasing, uh, it also increases the elastic recoil pressure and expiratory airflow, air and it reduces the ventilation and perfusion mismatch to improve the alveolar gas exchange and effectiveness of uh, ventilation. So you have patients with severe hyperinflation there. 
Okay, so the rationale for long volume reduction, why? So it has been shown that, you know, if you uh, improve the inspiratory capacity by doing long volume reduction, you will improve the endurance time on exercise uh, stress test. Okay. So what about long volume reduction surgery? So nobody answered this in LVRS, eh? offered by our friendly thoracic surgeons. Eh? So uh, it's based on this the net trial there, which showed that, you know, uh, LVRS uh, is useful in a subset of patients, uh, emphysema patients with upper lobe predominant emphysema and low exercise capacity. Okay, so it's not useful uh, you know, to, to be, you know, to be, uh, to, to everybody, but it's only in a subset of patients with emphysema. It's upper lobe and low exercise capacity, but uh, obviously it's associated with mortality there, okay? And so, so what's the rationale for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction? So basically, we are trying to reproduce the effect of lung volume reduction while while avoiding the, while avoiding the complication of surgery LVRS. And possibly, we 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 put offer the treatment to higher risk population or those not eligible for LVRS and those with significant comorbid conditions uh, with homogeneous or lower lobe predominant emphysema, you know that uh, LVR is only for those with upper lobe emphysema, if the patient has lower lobe predominant emphysema, LVR is not, uh, it's not going to be useful and perhaps uh, offer, you know, this uh, procedure in patients who are uh, ventilated, again, okay, in the hope that we can take the patient off the ventilator after uh, performing bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. So uh, there are various methods to perform lung volume reduction. I'll just focus on what uh, I do in my place, um, endobron uh, which are the endobronchial valve and vapor ablation. So I don't have expertise in, in others like uh, aspiration valve, foil, and sealant. So, okay, so endobronchial valve, anyway, um, uh, is the most widely studied bronchoscopic lung volume reduction technique. Okay, the idea is to induce uh, eight lactases of the targeted lobe, two models, either Zephyr valve or the Spiration valve. Um, uh, I only have experience in uh, using Zephyr valve. So, so this is our Zephyr valve, and this is a Spiration valve, like an umbrella. Right? So an endobronchial valve, either a zephyr or spiration valve, the in insertion um, uh, is, is not too difficult. Uh, you, uh, you can use either flexible or rigid bronchoscope, although in my center, uh, I do, do it routine, routinely via the rigid bronchoscope. It can be done under conscious sedation or general anesthesia, uh, and uh, the valve can easily be removed using biopsy forceps. Uh, I think that's easier said than done. Okay, and I, I had seen the centers uh, performing uh, endobronchial valve under conscious sedation. I think there's a bit of some struggle. There's a bit of struggle there. Okay, obviously because doing it under conscious sedation, I think it is much easier uh, if you do it under general anesthesia in a controlled environment. And then this, uh, hopefully, what we can achieve: uh, uh, lung collapse, epileptosis after endobronchial valve. So um, one of the early studies using endobronchial valve uh, came from the Venn trial. So they look at uh, two group. Uh, one group re received endobronchial valve, and one group, control group, received standard uh, medical uh, therapy. And they found that uh, there was a, there was an improvement in lung function test at but one, but a very modest improvement in FV1. And there's some complications uh, in the band trial that uh, COPD exacerbation, hemoptosis, hemothorax, pneumonia, and then mortality rate was similar in both groups. And at 12 months, uh, they had to remove the valve in 31 patients. When they look at the subgroup, subgroup of patients in the band study, they found that uh, this, uh, this subgroup of patients uh, had uh, more uh, significant improvement in FPV1. Though those patients with high heterogeneity uh, uh, and those patients with complete fissure. 
So you see there, uh, this patient has low uh, heterogeneity score and then this patient has high heterogeneity score. So, so, they, they, so they, these are the lessons from the Venn study. So they, they concluded that you know, perhaps you can identify potential responders um, uh, um, when you put endoprotal valve and you just have to uh, find patient with complete fissure and high heterogen, uh, hetero, heterogeneity. So, um, so this is the issue with the incomplete fissure because uh, incomplete fissure uh, is a surrogate marker for collateral ventilation. So in this case, like in this patient, this patient has complete fissure. So most likely that you know that there is no um, um, there is uh, there is uh, absence of collateral ventilation, and uh, in this case, um, this patient may benefit from uh, endobronchial valve. Okay, so complete fissure, meaning no collateral ventilation. When they put endobronchial valve, you achieve collapse or atelectasis. When there is a, when there is a uh, incomplete fissure here, that is present of collateral ventilation, you are not going to achieve uh, collapse, atelectasis when you put endoprocal valve. So how do we measure collateral ventilation? It's because we don't want to put valve uh, when there is present of collateral ventilation. So this is what they do using this uh, charting system. Um, so this is performed during the procedure itself. Uh, insert the catheter uh, through, um, through the working channel of a therapeutic bronchoscope and then you look at the monitor, you look at the response like here, the pattern here, uh, when the flow declines, okay, it means uh, there is no collateral ventilation and you can input endobronchial valve. In this, uh, uh, if you see this pattern here, it, it means that the patient has collateral ventilation and you don't put valve. Okay. So, uh, basically, this uh, slide shows that when you, when you have uh, absence of collateral ventilation, you get, you achieve significant lung volume reduction. Okay, and you don't achieve uh, lung volume reduction when there is presence of collateral ventilation. Okay, and then okay, I'm just going uh, through a few slides, uh, uh, a few studies, uh, uh, like this one, Stelvio trial, 84 subject. Um, so they excluded patient with collateral ventilation, uh, 68 subjects, randomized, one receive, one group receive valve, one uh, group receive standard care, and then there was improvement uh, in every one and six minute walk distance, but the motoric rate was quite high, 80%. Okay, but this was a short term, uh, short term study, about three months, I think. Okay, so uh, basically to summarize that, uh, showing the improvement in FV1 okay, in the EDV group compared to the control group. Okay. And then uh, you see there, you remember the band trial here, when uh, they didn't look, they, they only treated everybody, but when in the Stelvio trial, okay, they just focus on patient with uh, absence of collateral ventilation, you got better improvement in FV1 and six minute walk distance compared to uh, the group in the band trial there. So what about patient in, uh, with homogeneous emphysema? So will it, uh, will patient with homogeneous emphysema benefit from, um, from endobronchial valve? As you can imagine, a homogeneous emphysema meaning the, the entire lungs are, you know, are, are badly affected by emphysema. Okay, uh, unlike in heterogeneous emphysema, you, know, you can target, you know, one particular lobe. Well, uh, the evidence uh, came from this uh, uh, trial, uh, impact trial by uh, Dr. Valipo. Uh, so the conclusion is uh, you can achieve uh, improvement in, uh, in lung function and six minute walk distance, even in patients with homogeneous emphysema. So, I mean, so logically speaking, it doesn't make sense, but you know, it has been shown here, you know, that it, it, it works in, even in patients with homogeneous emphysema. So believer, HIFI study was a randomized trial of, e, um, uh, of EVV uh, in subject with intact fissure and heterogeneous emphysema and they had a sham uh, control group okay. 
and they measured collateral ventilation using the charty system prior to endobrothal valve implantation. So there was improvement in lung function and segmented walk, that walk distance, but small sample. Okay, again, uh, this is under study, transform study, okay. uh, looking at subject with heterogeneous emphysema and absence of collateral ventila ventilation, again showing improvement in FV1 and, and segmented walk distance. is showing the improvement in segmented walk distance compared to the uh, standard of care group. Okay. And um, although I routinely use the charty system uh, to confirm the presence or absence of collateral ventilation, uh, this uh, paper here shows that um, you may not need to use the charties you know, uh, uh, you know, to confirm the absence of collateral ventilation. Some people, I mean, based on this study, uh, it seems that using the Fisher integrity or full CT assessment uh, is good enough. You know, I mean, if you see that um, uh, on the CT scan there, the Fisher looks intact, you may not need to proceed with uh, the charties actually, because charties takes time and you have to insert the balloon there, and then, you know, you have to block one lobe, the upper lobe, lower lobe, to confirm the presence or absence of collateral ventilation. So I don't know about this, but in my practice, I still use the charter system to confirm the absence of collateral ventilation before I insert, uh, before I deploy the endobronchial valve. Okay, this is the, the study that led to the um, FDA approval. Okay, it was, I think it was last year in June. Yeah, in May last year. Okay, so Libre study. Um, uh, it was a multi-center randomized control trial of Zephyr and the bronchial valve in heterogeneous emphysema with little or no collateral ventilation. So improvement uh, in FV1, semi walk distance, SGRQ, air trapping, compared to standard of care. Okay, and the improvements, all the improvements are sustained at least uh, up to 12 months post procedure. The longest one so far, I think. The previous uh, studies I mentioned were all short term studies, six months, three months, but this is the longest one. And that this has led to um, um, uh, FDA approval. Okay, so back to our patient. What did I do? Obviously, I attempted to do endobronchial valve. Right, so let's see the video, my last slide. So, this is what um, we do. Okay, that's the chart is that show chart system there showing the decline in flow, confirming the absence of collateral ventilation. Then we deploy the valve. In this case, we put the valve uh, in the lower loop, if I'm not mistaken. See, this is the last valve we place. So we put it uh, on the carina there, not sitting on the carina there. Right, so you can see there the, the valve there, opening and closing there. Let's see. Last one, I think the, I put the valve in the LB6 thing, apical segment of left lower lobe. Okay. So this is on the uh, all the valve in the basal segment of left lower lobe and then one valve in the apical segment of the left lower lobe. And then this is what we got before endobronchial valve therapy. Okay, you can see that hyperinflated lung, diaphragm flat, flattened diaphragm and post endobronchial valve there, you can see that we, we, uh, we managed to achieve atelectasis with the left lower lobe there and then the right hemi diaphragm came up. So what about our experience? We have been doing this uh, in Malaysia for the past five years. I think 
uh, my team is going to present our experience in Chess Bangkok I think next month okay. and uh, just to share with you our data there um, 11 patients uh, everybody showed improvement in everyone except two patients here and then also there was reduction in uh, air trapping and improvement in gas transfer okay what, what else besides uh, endobronchial valve? Well, thermal vapor ablation uh, using steam to cause fibrosis uh, in sub-segments of, uh, of, 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 of that particular lobe. And in Malaysia, we, we did our first case uh, in December last year. Uh, this, this guy looks very familiar. Okay. I think Dr. Harry is here. Okay, so we did this case. Uh, uh, I was assisted by Professor Luo from China, who has a lot of experience in this. So basically, deli we deliver steam <coughs> to, to that particular uh, sub segment. Okay, and, to, and you can see the blanching of the area after uh, ablation. So the good, the, the good thing about this uh, technique is you don't leave any foreign body inside there. Okay, so I think it is a very promising, promising technique. So I think this is the paradigm shift in, in terms of uh, how we manage emphysema. You have drug, rehab oxygen, uh, LVRS in the past and lung transplant, but LVRS I think will be replaced by bronchoscopic treatment for emphysema. So are we ready for BL, BLVR? Yes, I think so. Okay, but you have to please your thoracic surgeons always have that backup okay, thank you very much okay. uh, thank you very much dr jamal aziz and uh, what i gather from this is that in case there is a non-functioning part of the lung let us not waste the labor of work of breathing for it and let it go collapse by this technique of volume reduction um, and of course that you have to make assessment for your collateral ventilation for that because if there's anything which is again ventilating it, maybe your valve will not work. So that was one important uh, parameter for judging the response of this technique. Uh, I'm interested in knowing, uh, can you perform it in things other than emphysema also when you have a non-functioning or a problematic lung segment, say a bronchitic segment there? Um, the short answer is uh, no. Uh, I mean, uh, I am not aware of uh, the role of endobronchial valve in bronchiac in non-functioning segment in a patient with bronchiectasis. Uh, I'm not aware, but I don't know in the future. Um, you know, uh, if things change in the future, maybe I don't know. But I mean, besides uh, emphysema, endobronchial valve is also used uh, to treat. Uh, persistent air leak, uh, bronchopleural fissula, and I, so far I only had one experience in using uh, endobronchial valve in persistent air leak. Mm. Yeah, because usually in children, I, you know, I talk from the viewpoint of a pediatrician all along, so we don't get such kind of things in children, I, then like emphysema and all those, but uh, I mean, bronchitis is not so common. Yeah, I can understand so I coming try. from a pediatrician. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else interested in asking any question, any queries there? There's some? Most of the endobronchial valves have uh, used uh, upper lobe emphysema, isn't it? Bilateral upper lobe emphysema is the target. So, is it that valves can or predominantly should be put in the upper lobes or uh, can they be safely put on the lower lobes as well? Because we we'll need to put multiple valves in every patient. Yeah, so as you remember, the, the case that I showed, the video there, that patient had emphysema predominantly in the lower lobe, in the left lower lobe. So we put the valve in the low, left lower lobe. So that's a good thing about this technique. Uh, you can put the valve in the upper lobe, in the lower lobe, unlike uh, the surgical option, LVRS, which is only confined to the upper lobe. Any more questions? Hello, sir. I am Dr. Masala. There are some cases of giant bulla. 
लोकलाइज इन पर्टिकुलर लो लाइक अपर लो कैन दोज पेशेंट भी बेनिफिटेड विद इन द ब्रॉन्कल वॉल ट्रीटमेंट उटली Uh, it was uh, difficult. Um, obviously, upper lobe is always difficult. Um, uh, there, there is only a, a scenario when you may place it in, in the wrong place. You know, uh, it, it is in the upper lobe actually, especially the apical segment, which is the most tricky part. But uh, whether you can manipulate, yes, you can. But yeah, I think it's easier to manipulate when you are doing it by really bronchoscopy actually. and when in a control situation you know i had one case um from another center referred to me that my colleague there was doing endobronchial valve under conscious sedation he couldn't complete the procedure because the patient was struggling under conscious sedation so he had to refer the case to me just to put the last valve so i think you know people can say they can do it under conscious sedation but i think it's much easier to do it why you really bronchoscopy when especially when you have to adjust the position of the re- of the valve you know in the apical segment correct recommendation is to do it under uh, GOE bridge bronchoscopy yeah. oh, thank you so with that we conclude the session and i thank dr patiba and dr jamal aziz for these wonderful talks and enriching us all thank you very much sir you mentioned earlier the uh, in the maximum of cases how much of the transmic acid we should give what should the ideal dose or we should dilute it or what okay um well um normally i how much is it normally i i, I will use me one or two vials you know for, for instance and try to um control uh, the bleeding uh, but i think transmic acid is only useful in mild hemoptysis not in massive hemoptysis i would use uh, endobronchial blocker in massive hemoptysis e or if i anticipate massive bleeding after endobronchial biopsy or cryobiopsy i i I'm, i prefer to use uh, endobronchial block blocker rather than using uh, you know a trinasamic acid thank you thank you sir uh, i would like uh, dr nabe to sir, come on more sir oh. we have one more question i'm sorry Have time. Sir, because these are one-way wall, so yeah. is there any possible? What are the risk of infection in those cases? Infection. Yeah. Um, so far, I haven't encountered any uh, uh, any patient uh, of mine who develop infection. You know, granulation tissue can develop. You know, uh, but infection per se, no. No. So Unlike a thermal vapor ablation, the you know you, you, the patient could develop pneumonia. You know. Uh, after the procedure and then the, the first case that we did we gave the patient antibiotic prophylactically because uh, so infection is uh, an issue in thermal vapor ablation but not not really an issue in endobronchial valve actually so and there is any bleeding because those prongs are metallic and they usually bleeding involves bleeding in abv endobronchial yeah. valve yeah. i have an encounter it shouldn't shouldn't cause bleeding so sir one more thing regarding my previous question for janbull because many times patients come at young age 16 year 18 year as far as i have seen two such cases they were referred for lung uh, resection of the bully but if those patient can be put on wall because that wall be for life long there single bully okay but i think the the best treatment is still surgical option i think bullectomy okay. for single bully but multiple bully uh, 
valve are not possible. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Naved to come on the stage and felicitate one of our chairperson, uh, Professor Farzana Beg. Next, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Khushid Dutt to come on the stage and felicitate uh, our next chairperson, uh, Dr. Saurabh. next uh, and the last session for the day, uh, I would like to invite the uh, chairperson of the session, Professor uh, Rakesh Bhargav from Department of TB and Respiratory Diseases and Professor Afzal Anis from Department of Surgery and Dr. Mukul Saxena. Welcome to the last session, but very important session because in this we have two lectures and one is on airway stenting, choice of stent and follow-up bronchoscopic management of tracheal stenosis. The speaker is Dr. Anand Mohan. At, at present he is professor and head of Department of Pulmonary Medicine and Sleep Disorder, AIMS. He is member of fellow college of uh, chest physician at Parsi London, fellow of American College of Chest Physician. He has got the award of UK Commonwealth uh, Fellowship as International Clinical Fellow in Chest Medicine at Royal Preston uh, Hospital, Preston, Lancashire, UK. He is also member of Independent Expert Committee of Serious Edwards Effect Drug Controller General. He is member of Special Committee of Special Center for Molecular Medicine. JNU since September 2016. His nodal officer in charge of AIMS dot center. Welcome, Dr. Anand Mohan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shamim and his team for very kindly inviting uh, me here. Uh, I'll uh, I'll be talking about airway stenting in this workshop on uh, rigid bronchoscopy today. I, th I think airway stents are uh, one of the kind of uh, the ultimate uh, glamour tool that you have you know when you when you stent somebody and and you save his life or you improve his symptoms then that gives you the greatest uh, satisfaction in a way so the for everybody who is going in for a interventional pulmonology kind of kind of a setup then probably airway stenting is something that you definitely ought to know and that that may be your yardstick as far as successful management of the airways are concerned so Briefly, we'll be talking about the choice of stents and the bronch bronchoscopic management of tracheal stenosis following stenting. Uh, remember, it is it is nice to be an interventional pulmonologist, but also remember that as part of our our commitment to patients, we should make a habit of two things: we should help, or if we can't help, at least we should never do any harm to the patient. So that uh, that holds good as far as airway stenting is concerned as well. So to introduce the topic, uh, stents are basically uh, tube-shaped devices. They are they have a hollow lumen which are inserted into an airway. More more often than not, they are a palliative kind of a procedure. They are a bridge to some other curative uh, therapy for patients with the various types of uh, airway diseases. 
Of course, the central airway obstruction due to malignant disorders are the most common the indications as far as airway stenting is concerned. But there are a number of other indications which include benign causes of central airway obstruction, esophageal or tracheal or bronchial esophageal fistulas, bronchomalacias, tracheobronchomalacias and anastomotic dehiscence after lung transplantation as well to name a few of them. And these are the list of the indications which can be considered when airway stenting has to be done. The most common are the malignant diseases which may be extrinsic or there may be uh, endobronchial tumors as well but they have a, a, some kind of extra bronchial component or some kind of residual obstruction after thermal therapy, mixed tumors with both extra as well as intraluminal components or where, when there is some lack of or loss of the cartilaginous support to the airways so that they start collapsing or malignant tracheobronchial or esophageal fistulas. Then certain benign conditions as you can see there's include uh, benign complex uh, stenosis which may be long ones also or other strictures in inoperable patients because in benign as far as possible one should try and go for surgical therapy wherever feasible so as to give a better quality of life and longevity. If that is not possible then going for stenting only as a last option and then all these we have already talked about. As far as the types of stents are concerned, broadly speaking, they are just two or three types of stents. One is the silicon stents, which have been there since they, they are the oldest ones. They were the first, uh, they were the ones to be introduced. Then the metal stents came up and they can be either uncovered or they can be covered. We'll talk about that soon. And there are the hybrid stents in which it is a kind of a hybrid of a metal along with silicon um, uh, as a covering, so a mixed kind of a stents. And recently there is more and more research going into the biodegradable uh, stents and the drug eluting stents also for various diseases. So we will we'll be going through them in um, brief. As far as the characteristics of an ideal stent, so what type of stent do we want? So there are some, some properties that we all want in a stent. First it should be easy to insert, it should be economically viable, affordable. Obviously, it has to be available in various sizes and lengths because every person's airway is different. We need we, we, we need not go in for a 6 cm long stent for a small fistula. So, all those things we have to see. The diameter, we have to see the airway diameter. So, it should be available in different sizes. It should be able to re-establish the airway with minimal morbidity and of course, no mortality. It should have a good expansile strength. So, it, sometimes when the airways are very tight, it should be able to having enough strength to stretch them as well and they should not cause any ischemia or any other erosion of the bronchial or the tracheal mucosa so no ischemic necrosis should occur there should not be migration we'll see that migration is one of the common complications of a stent especially the silicon stent but at the same time it should be easily removable as well so whenever we feel that we have done whatever we had to do and patient doesn't need it any further we should be able to remove it easily it should be made of a material which is relatively inert. It should not be causing any reactions, should not be irritant. It should not cause any infections or promote granulation tissue. And also lastly should preserve the mucociliary clearance and the function of the bronchial mucosa so that that remains undisturbed. But unfortunately that still this kind of a inert, this kind of ideal stent does not exist as of now. So we have to make do with whatever we have. and. We have a uh, several stents now in our armamentarium and you can see we have a large variety of uh, metallic stents which may be covered, which may be uncovered and they are of different sizes, different shapes. Then these are the silicon stents, again they are the Y shaped stents, they can be the, the straight ones and then they can be the slightly curved ones and then they are the T shaped type also and they can be custom made as well. So depending upon our needs sometimes we can get them custom made depending upon the situation and that works now well pretty well as well but they all have the advantages and disadvantages and this just uh, highlights a few of them let's go to the silicon stents first and the advantages of course is it's pretty uh, it's a very firm device it's a uh, durable it resists any extrinsic compression there is relatively low risk of granulation tissue and tumor infiltration as compared to the metallic it happens it's still the complication is there but relatively less it is much easier to reposition and remove whenever it is required. So, in this situation, we use silicon stents when for mostly benign conditions or when we need a temporary bridge to tide over some kind of a period when we can and then remove subsequently. But the disadvantage is it has a higher tendency to migrate and that may be a really big problem because it, the basic disease then the again flares up. 
usually it requires a rigid bronchoscopy and a GA. It is highly unlikely that you will be able to put a, a silicon stent under flexible bronchoscope. You can't do. You will have to have a rigid scope with you. Uh, they are the earlier ones were not radio opaque, but now the silicon stents have got the small radio opaque buttons in the midline, which can be visible by X-ray. Uh, they in a, they inhibit the mucociliary clearance a little bit more as compared to the metallic stent. And expense-wise, of course, all stents are expensive. But depending upon where you are staying and what function, what the facilities you have, in our in India at least, whatever we use, the silicon stents prove to be more expensive as compared to the metallic stents. But in the West, probably the opposite is true. But that depends upon where we are staying. The types of silicon stents again, they can be smooth walled and they can be studded. So the studded stents are one which are the most widely used, and they can come in different shapes and sizes. These studs which are there are there because they have a they help us to get a good grip on the bronchial or the tracheal surface so that it doesn't slip and it has a good snug fitting and that is the function of these uh, studs and uh, they also come in various uh, lengths. Here we can see the smooth wall. There are no studs here and this is of a kind of a Y shape type. This goes into the right main. This goes into the left and this length also can be adjusted. Then there are certain other varieties like the Tigon stent over here, not very commonly used. In fact, we have never seen it also. They are something in which there is a plastic tube which is now molded into a kind of a screw, screw shaped device so that it gives a good tensile strength and a good grip as well. So coming to the metallic stents which are more commonly used actually, the advantages are that they can be put even using the flexible bronchoscope. So that is why the, the reachability among the pulmonologists may be more because it does not always require a rigid. It has good adherence property, it has a good, it is radio opaque also, when we do the x-ray we can see the stent on the, on the film. It is self-expanding and it is a good tensile strength, it can even distend the most firm structure. So that is not a problem, it has relatively lesser effect on the mucociliary clearance as well. But there are certain disadvantages, greater risk of airway or vascular per perforation because it is metallic. So obviously it is more, more hard, there are chances of perforation into the soft bronchial mucosa. It, may, it is absolutely, uh, it is very difficult to reposition or even more difficult to remove it once we have put it, especially after three or four weeks. It becomes well nigh impossible to even move it because you can't see there is granulation, there may be epithelialization, so it is covered. So we cannot, cannot remove. That is why we use silicon, the metallic stent mostly for malignant purposes where we don't need to remove it also. There is much greater frequency of granulation tissue formation which is a big problem and even tumor regrowth into the stent. They are of course expensive and relatively less durable because the metal may get sometimes worn off, the loss of tensile strength, there may be fracture, all these things may, may happen. So that is one problem with the metal stents. Just a few photographic examples of the uncovered metallic stent over here. Then the hybrid stents are those which are actually a mixture. So there is a, a the metal stent and they may be covered with a silicon. So, so they are partially covered by a thin silicon membrane and for example you can see over here or they can be silicon covered plastic stents as well. So various types are available, we are not going into all the various types here. The common ones used are the metallic, self expanding metallic stents either uncovered which also is not really being used, mostly one, uh, one is using the covered metallic stents these days. And uh, just to introduce you the biodegradable uh, degradable stents, they are investigational, they have been used in, in uh, several studies now, they are made of certain polymers and what happens is that they, this degrades after it is put in the airway over a period of time. So it does not require any extraction. What, what we can do is when we need it only for a couple of weeks or so, we can put it. After that it maintains the strength for a few weeks and then it dissolves completely over a period of 3 to 4 months. So it may be useful for airway conditions that require only a temporary stent. And then now stents just like coronary stents, we are having tracheal stents which have got drug eluting properties in development and for example compounds like paclitaxel which prevent granulation tissue are, are being tried and there are publications to that effect as well and probably in the next couple of years we will be seeing more about the drug eluting stents as well. Then other investigational stents are the three dimensional printed stents which may be tailor made to the individual's uh, anatomy. Of course, and it can theoretically be prepared even a couple of days or even maybe hours people have tried it and it can it can be customized as far as the anatomy of that particular patient is concerned. And now we are having slightly smaller with the mini stents which can be put into lobes and not just into the central airways and they can prevent, probably it has been hypothesized 
that if we do it they can prevent potential lower pneumonias to maintain the patency of that particular small lobe as well and this just shows a brief summary of the advantages and disadvantages of the various uh, airway stents that we have comparing the silicon the uncovered metal and the covered metal stents as you can see the silicon is the one that requires rigid bronchoscope the others can be put even with the flexible migration is more of a problem with the silicon stents the, the granulation tissue can be there in all of them but it is most common with the uncovered metallic stent so that is really not being used much these days chances of airway perforation with the metallic ones uh, the suitability for indefinite use is only there in the silicon in the in the metallic it is not really suitable unless it's a malignant of course but ideally one would like to prevent anybody living lifelong with a with a stent in his place Mucus plugging can occur with all of them, but more with the silicon. Stent fracture is also most commonly occurring with the metallic stents as well, and cost always remains a concern. Technically, there are certain uh, differences when we actually go into put put in, put in the stent. For example, the metallic stent can be deployed in situations where there may be good airway, significant airway narrowing, but we do not re need to recanalize. But we can put a silicon stent only. when we take the scope beyond the narrow lesion and then we deploy the stent into the particular position so that may be a problem and this dictates the choice of the stent that we have to put in so all this we have to check beforehand in every patient by a bronchoscope and then decide which which thing is suitable which type of stent is suitable for which patient primarily metallic is for malignant where silicon should be given for benign because it can be removed as a bridge to maybe surgery or some other definitive therapy technically sems is slightly easier slightly easier and this silicon is challenging again because it needs a uh, the uh, rigid it needs one to go beyond the lesion to deploy which again can be a problem uh, metallic stents they have elastic properties good elastic properties it mostly it opens on their own silicon stent many times we have seen that they have a tendency to fold inside so when they fold inside then using a forceps or we have to put in a balloon and we have to inflate so so it requires some kind of a manipulation even after it has been deployed because the tensile strength may not be as strong and uh, it can be deployed under exclusive fluoroscopic control and silicon silicon needs actual direct visualization but unfortunately when we are pushing in the silicon then there is no way that we are seeing the silicon being deployed because that we don't have that space in the rigid to see the to put in a optics also by the side so once we have decided the place we push in blindly and then we take out our deployer and then we visualize so these are some technical differences between the metallic and the silicon stents uh, how to select and what are the factors we determine the choice of stent we have already talked about most of that uh, the anatomy of the lesion is very important the presence of airway malacia has to be looked at the presence of fistula sizing of course has to be done ideally there are there, there are some instruments meant for sizing but more often than not one just uses a general size for example a, a normal size adult person in the trachea we have different sizes 16 mm 18 mm diameter then we have the various length that we have to decide previously then we have to try and avoid the stent related complications so we do not put stents very near to the carina because if there is any granulation that is likely to occlude the right or the left main bronchus so all these factors have to be kept in mind and then lastly the preference and the experience of the person who is doing it is of paramount importance because that is what ultimately dictates the success or the failure rate generally for benign structures strictures put stents which can be easily removed and replaced for tracheomalacia we can use uncovered metallic stents for endoluminal obstruction with or without any fistula we can use either a covered metallic or a silicon it doesn't really matter when there is a tortuosity or a distorted airway sometimes in fibrotic disease or in endobronchial tuberculosis sequel it happens metallic stent is better because it conforms well with the actual anatomy of the airways rather than a silicon stent and when there is pure extrinsic compression silicon metallic is better because the radial force can be ex uh, exerted uniformly across the stent which may not be the case with silicon stents and just a couple of pictorials to uh, to show us this is the metallic stent deployer and this is the metallic stent which is coming out we'll show that in the work workstations later on how it is to be done and this is the loading set of the silicon stent that we have and so, so this these are the various parts we, we load the stent over here inside this and then we we push the stent through into one of this this is the ultimate deployer in the uh, which is used to push the stent so st stent is over here and using this part we 
push it through and the stent comes out from this side into the tracheobronchial tree. So that is the entire mechanism. So now I will just go over a couple of cases that, that will show how a stent is deployed in various clinical situations and in this situation as you can see in this patient uh, a marked compression of the trachea over here as you can see almost a chink like trachea and here we are putting a tracheal self expanding metallic stent uh, and this is uh, under rigid bronchoscopy. So this is the stent deployer under direct vision we can put it and as we are, see the stent is coming out from here now and as we the stent is getting deployed we are taking we are pulling this rigid bronchoscope back and under direct vision we are gradually opening up these stents slowly. So depending on what we have to be careful that it should be at least 2 centimeters away from the carina because granulation will form we don't want that to impringe upon the left or right main bronchus and also it, it should be a reasonable distance below the vocal cords because granulation is the biggest problem on the long term for metallic stents and if it causes a granulation here then I think it is going to be a big big problem for the patient rather than helping we would be actually condemning him to further problems. So this is the deployment of a straight tracheal stent via the rigid bronchoscope. It can be done by the flexible as well and the, um, that also is quite easily possible. Uh, just a couple of pictorials. So this is one situation where there was a mixed lesion, endobronchial as well as extra bronchial component, and we put in a metallic stent here. As you can see, the extra bronchial, the intra bronchial component is not yet fully covered. So there are threads over here which you can hold by the forceps, and we can pull the stent up and reposition. So that is one advantage. It has a it has a thread that can help us to position the stent wherever. So even if we have uh, uh, deployed little distal, little pro proximal, we have options to put it in the right place. Another case was a 40 year old female who had a history of corrosive ingestion about 6 months ago and gradually progressive dyspnea, strider and there was a tracheoesophageal fistula. So here you can see uh, this, is a, this is the bronchoscopic view and you can see this kind of a pit over here. In this part there is a fistula over here which is not very clearly visible but it was seen at that point of time and we wanted to kind of uh, put a silicone stent. This is the silicone stent that we had put and you can see we can't see the silicone stent actually being deployed. We can only see it later on and it was not put in the absolute right position. It was quite folded. You can see over here it is not vertical. It is actually going into the left main bronchus. So I will just go through this and I will just show you what we did. So this was the position that we had. We tried to grasp it with the forceps after some time. This can cause a, this can actually have caused a problem. This was causing airway comp uh, airway uh, compromise at that time. We put it, we held it with a force and we pulled it up, and then you can see it is right there in the trachea and it can be nicely positioned, right? And then we went inside and we saw that it is a little up from the carina. The carina is free. We have a choice. We, we can even pull it up a little bit further so as to keep the carina free. So these manipulations will have to be done once we have a silicon stent in place. And uh, this was I think the post stenting photo which we have already seen. Another case of uh, a 51 year old male a reformed smoker with a CA esophagus again coming with cough and shortness of breath for the last one month and this was the CT scan of this patient. You can see this large lesion causing significant luminal compromise of the lower part of the trachea and also of the right and the left main bronchus. And for this we had to put in a Y stent and this is a indigenously made Y stent. Y stent means See what happens, we can't put a tracheal stent here because we have to we have to open the carina area and the right and left main bronchus. So tracheal stent won't work. The Y stent is one which has got two limbs, one goes into the right, one goes into the left and there is one which covers the carina. So, uh, so that is what we will we'll do over here, I will show you how we did that. This is the upper part of that stent deployer. This is the thread for the left side, this is the thread for the right. So we have three stents in one. One, when we pull out the thread of the left one from top when assistant, then the left sided bronchial stent will open. When we pull the thread of the right side, the right bronchial stent will open. And then when we deploy, then gradually the tracheal part will get deployed. So we have a full Y stent which is made covering the trachea and both the main bronchus. And this video will show you how that is done. And this is under again rigid. So this is the stent deployer. We have put in the entire assembly and you can see this is the, this is the one which is coming out and will go into the left side. So we have to kind of manipulate you know we have to push it. So this has been pushed into the left main bronchus and now this one will come and it will go into the right main bronchus there like that. This is the right 
um, uh, bronchial part, this is the left bronchial part. Now somebody from outside will pull out the left one and somebody then will pull out the right one. So both the bronchial stents have been deployed. Once that has been done, then uh, gradually we pull this whole thing back. So now we are pulling this entire deployer back slowly, slowly and the tracheal part of the stent is getting deployed. So this entire procedure will cover the trachea and both the right and the left mid bronchus as well, main bronchus as well. And once that is done, then you can see this whole apparatus has come out and we go inside and the stent can be seen it is nicely deployed. We, we clear out the secretions in the distal part and we come back and this is the stent. This is sitting nicely on the carina. Right and the left are free and this is the tracheal part as well. So these, this kind of a stent is good for lesions which are very near to the carina and likely to occlude the either left or the main uh, right main bronchus where we can't put in a tracheal stent alone. So like I said in the beginning that every it is not that we can just go in right left and center and start putting stents in every patient who has got a airway stenosis because they have their own complications and there is a whole list of complications that can occur in a varied number of patients that we have to be very very careful. Granulation tissue is very common up to almost 25 percent patients may have mucous impaction is common within the stent that is why after a stent has been placed we have to do check bronchoscopies we have to give steam inhalation we have to give nebulization chest physiotherapy to prevent secretions being pulled inside and causing problems subsequently infections may happen tumor ingrowth is more common when there are uncovered metallic stents and that is also a big problem that is why it is no longer actually being used stent migration much more common with the silicon stents because they have a tendency to slip rather than metallic stent fractures may occur and we'll show you a couple of photos for that more common with metallic stent where the wires break and that can be traumatic and just a couple of photos this is uh, the granulation tissue which is formed on top of the metallic stent and mostly it's a late complication but may be very very severe and problematic and it has to be managed mostly either by mechanically debulking pulling out with the forceps or local ablative therapies like cryo, cautery, APC and sometimes you may even need to remove the stent if it doesn't really work out. Uh, so one another problem that may happen because this was a video of a st uh, uh, granulation tissue. So this is a silicon stent and you can just see over here granulation at the bottom. See this huge granulation tissue at the lower part of the stent causing significant luminal compromise. So this is life threatening. It has to be removed. And below this, it was all okay. So what we did over here was we did a cautery. We used a cautery knife. And you can see we tried to burn off a part of this uh, the granulation tissue. We could have used other modalities also. We could have pulled it out with a cryo also. So there are various ways of doing the things. But we prefer to use a cautery over here. And you will see that we made horizontal incisions like you can see over here. We made a horizontal incision and gradually we tried to we devascularize and we also removed it then by means of a forceps and we were able to achieve at least some degree 50 percent degree of luminal patency and this is the part that we removed and you can see that there is some opening and then we did some more so we were able to remove most of the granulation and achieve patency but these are genuine problems and this will keep on happening so one has to be very careful about all of these this is a stent fracture you can see all the wires from the stent has has come out and this can be a really problematic uh, problematic situation and the stent has to be removed in this kind of a situation. Sometimes there may be tracheal tears while putting in a metallic stent especially or, or if you have put in a large size metallic strength, uh, stent as compared to the airway it may cause um, uh, uh, tears mostly in the posterior wall of the airways. And as you have already said tumor in growth may, occurring, uh, may occur which can cause occlusion. So, Tracheal stenosis or strictures may be there because of many conditions. We are not going into the treatment of that but mostly because of why it happened because of stents. So it was the granulation tissue that mostly happens but there can be several other conditions which can lead to tracheal stenosis or stricture and that have to be man uh, managed accordingly. Any tracheal stricture or stenosis with because or because of other reasons than stent need to be kind of taken care of by dilatation. Dilatation can be done by various means. And one way is to do a mechanical rigid dilatation and this is how it is done using the bevel of the rigid bronchoscope. We try and use sequentially increasing sizes of the bronchoscope and go inside. And this is one video which I would like to show of an electrocautery dilatation of a severe tracheal stenosis. And you can see this severe tracheal stenosis in the mid trachea 
and what we did is that we went inside using the electro cautery probe this is the electro cautery electro cautery knife and this was all because of post inflammatory kind of benign post inflammatory stenosis and stricture so here you can see that we took out the knife and we are burning it kind of a we giving incisions over here so this one incision another incision over here so what we usually is typically mentioned as a mercedes benz sign once we have done this we can put in a balloon inside we can inflate and try and increase the diameter and the opening of the airway so this is how we did it it looks a bit messy but over a period of time it heals off and then later on we can we can achieve a better amount of patency and here we have got a patency actually we have gone beyond the lesion yeah no here is the lesion and by ballooning we were able to achieve a much better patency then we went in with the bronchoscope dilated the whole area and we were able to achieve more than 50 to 60% of the luminal uh, of what were the origin original one Uh, lastly the last video is a very simple method of dilating the uh, stenosis by means of a balloon dilatation and we can just for example you can see we are putting in the fogarty balloon and there is the stenosis inside we can put in the balloon slowly of a, of and we have a kind of a controlled radial expansion uh, pump outside which pushes in the saline and expands the balloon and you will see we have to position the balloon right at the center part of the maximum stenosis and then we will inflate it once that is inflated we try and give a tuck from outside to see that now yes it is now a snug fit and there is a good amount of traction so here we are inflating and we will look for the traction once the traction is there we keep it for a couple of seconds deflate again do it maybe do it for uh, for about three or four times with greater amount of uh, saline and by that we can very in a simple manner we can achieve much better luminal patency in especially in benign structures so i just uh, finish off and summarize here regarding stents we know that uh, stents provide very rapid and symptomatic improvement in patients with central airway obstruction i have deliberately not gone into any studies but there are several studies which have shown rapid improvement in symptoms quality of life dyspnea and exercise capacity of patients who have benign or malignant disorders with the use of stent because all that is well known and the, this is a workshop so won't go into too much theory but we should be very careful that short term and long term complications are also very common so it is a very very uh, the most important thing is a judicious patient and a stent selection so first of all we have to decide whether a stent is required or not if it is required then we have to decide what type of stent is required and also we should try and monitor these patients and follow up these patients after every there are no set guidelines as far as the follow up is concerned there are no guidelines regarding the follow up some people have done it even on a weekly basis some have done it two monthly three monthly so 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 it doesn't really improve survival but what it does is it helps us to know that there is no stent migration there are no complications and if there is any complication it can be tackled at the earliest possible time so because we don't have the ideal stent research is still going on to kind of make new stents new techniques to offset the complications of the currently existing stents and these include the use of biodegradable stents or the use of drug eluting stents and also three dimensional printing devices which may be coming up in the next couple of years so so we'll have to kind of watch this space and see what what better things we have so thank you very much thank you dr adan for very elaborate lecture on the stent even if you have any question we can uh, you're welcome for one or two questions sir in case of extrinsic compression is there any limitations that up to what compromise can be expanded in stenting or all the patient can be subjected to stenting because there are certain patient which are having only 20 or 30% of patent lumen and there is complete encircling by malignant lymph node and uh, invasion of the mediastinum by tumors so will those patient respond to stenting or stenting will not be in those patients uh, no actually there is no cut off there is no cut off that uh, up to this or beyond this much luminal compromise it will help or within less than that it will not help but patient usually becomes symptomatic start becoming symptomatic when 50% or more luminal compromises occurred and they become and it is critical when more than 75 to 80% of luminal compromises occurred so i think that should be the threshold even if it is 90% uh, cut off even if 90% compromise there if technically you are able to stent then one should go ahead because your aim is to palliate and give symptomatic improvement 
so as long as you are able to get that much of opening to put in the deployer and the the stent deployer through that opening i think you are okay but if you for example a silicon if you cannot even go beyond the stenosis then you cannot put in the silicon stent because that will not reach the right place but metallic yes you can stay suppose the lesion is here you can stay here and your deployer can just go within that area so a couple of millimeter is all you need to put in that deployer and then you can deploy there and it will because of a tensile strength it will expand the airways now how much it will expand that we don't know sometimes sometimes especially in silicon one can put the stent put in the balloon and inflate that also to try and help but uh, more often than not we have seen reasonably good expansion at least at least more than 60 70% expansion so good enough to palliate the patient thank you dr anand uh, i have one question for you in, uh, in one of the presentation you have shown that there was there, there was an stenosis you cut by the cautery and then finally you did the balloon dilatation yeah. so what in my opinion it's better to go for repeated a uh, balloon dilatation rather than cutting by the cautery because cautery again leads to a lot of fibrosis yeah. and again re so what what you say right yeah this? sure so um, the, in this kind of situation first thing would be to assess whether the person is uh, a surgical candidate so that if there is this was a pretty severe stenosis if a localized um, you know resection can be done of the trachea and an end to end anastomosis can be made then that is the ideal option so again this situation was to tide over the crisis and make him fit enough for that kind of a definitive procedure one can attempt a balloon but the only thing was there was so much of fibrosis and cicatrization we earlier put in the balloon and we tried to expand it did not work so it was so hard and so fibrous the balloon did not uh, expand that is why we had to kind of open with some other means right right thank you and then in another case there was a hypercannulation and you cut by the knife yes that was granulation granulation yeah so is there any uh, uh, snare like so that we can excise it properly with hemostasis instead of cutting perhaps there may be some ooze some bleeding will be there yeah snare yes the only thing was that this was a granulation at just at the lower end of the silicon stent so we did not want to risk burning okay. the stent burning the stent. yeah so we want that is why if you note we did the cautery very much away from the stent in the center of the lumen right. to keep it away from the stent right thank you dr oh, thank, you. thank you for the nice presentation thank you now we are going to call our next speaker dr hari kishan uh, he is at present the head department uh, division of interventional pulmonology yashoda hospital secunderabad he is a member and fellow of thoracic endoscopy japan and he is a fellow in interventional pulmonology mahidol university thailand he has so many around 25 international and national present uh, publications and presentation and eight publications so i request dr hari kishan uh, to go by his presentation and the topic is tracheobronchial debulking of tumor so please dr hari kishan Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I thank uh, Dr. Shamim and the uh, organizing secretary for ACIP for giving me this opportunity. I also greet uh, Dr. Jamalu, Dr. Prithiva Singhal, and Dr. Anand Mohan. So today my topic is on tracheobronchial tumors and what will be a pulmonologist intervention pulmonologist approach. So in this brief 15-20 minutes talk, I'll be covering on the etiology of tracheobronchial tumors, how we define central airway obstruction. how the how the patients with central airway obstruction present to us and how we diagnose them what is the role of uh, intervention bronchologist and what are the different de obstruction techniques procedural basics and troubleshooting during the procedure procedural complications and outcomes of endoscopic approach on the quality of life symptom relief and survival so why i kept this survival here in the end is because uh, these are mostly palliative procedures we are not looking uh, survival as the end point we are looking at the improvement in quality of life as well as symptom relief 
So coming to the etiology, primary tracheal tumors are very rare. If at all uh, they arise, like uh, there are three layers uh, from which they arise. Most of the commonest tumors are squamous cell carcinomas. They arise from the uh, squam surface epithelium. The other tumors like adenoid cystic carcinoma, mucoepidermoid and the myoepithelial tumors, they arise from salivary glands. And very rarely you see malignant lymphomas and sarcoma which arise from the missing chyme. And the most commonest to tracheobronchial tumors we come across in our practice are from uh, distance uh, like metastatic uh, from thyroid from the local regional uh, organs like thyroid or laryngeal CA, lung cancer and esophageal uh, cancers and some uh, from distant metastasis and also some are benign. So there is a sometimes looking at the location of the tumors we can also uh, say from where the tumor is arising from. Most of the thyroid tumors they arise in the proximal part of the trachea Tracheal, primary tracheal tumors mostly on the right side, esophageal on the left, lymphomas and lymph node metastasis on subcarinal areas and some bronchial tumors in the bronchial areas. So how do we define uh, central airway obstruction? Any obstruction of the trachea, right main bronchus or left main bronchus or the bronchus intermediates. Considering a mean airway diameter of 12 to 18 mm for the trachea, 10 to 16 for the right main and 8 to 14 for the left main bronchus. Most of the literature says that less than 8 mm patients will have dyspnea until then they don't have symptoms and less than 5 mm they have dyspnea at rest. But this is a myth because dyspnea in these patients is not, uh, it is multifactorial. All these patients are mostly COPD, smokers and uh, end stage palliative patients. So coming to the classification of central airway obstruction, you have three types of uh, central airway obstructions. One is intraluminal. The entire mass is lying inside the tracheobronchial tree. Extraluminal, you have component outside the tracheal wall compressing the trachea and causing symptoms. And you have a mixed tumor where you have both intrinsic as well as extrinsic components. So coming to diagnostic evaluation, for some reasons, all these malignancy patients present very late and they are often uh, misdiagnosed as asthma or COPD. Chest X-ray in these patients might be unremarkable. PFT always look at the flow volume groups because they are the first things to bend. And uh, chest CT, when you are ordering chest CTs, always ask for multiplanar reconstruction images with volume rendering. And also look for a virtual bronchoscopy to assess beyond the obstruction what is there. And always before submitting them for a therapeutic rigid bronchoscopic procedure, always uh, do a flexible bronchoscopy either with the adult or pediatric scope to localize, to define the length and also to see the distal airway patency, if possible, get a biopsy to confirm diagnosis before therapeutic bronchoscopy. These are in selected elective patients. And also discuss with your oncology team regarding the further treatment plan after your therapeutic procedure. So this is the central airway obstruction evaluation algorithm that is described in the literature, so that I already described. So tumor debulking al algorithm always make an action plan. First look at the patient, and decide whether the patient needs an immediate relief or you can postpone the procedure or he needs a late effect by the therapeutic procedure what we are offering. Second thing, identify the type of uh, airway obstruction to look whether you need to stent the patient or just a therapeutic debulking will do and then treat the interluminal component first and also assess the residual degree of airway obstruction. So coming to tools and technical aspects you can divide these things in uh, the equipment what we have for uh, debulking the tumors. So these equipments can be classified into two things. One is those which will cause an immediate effect and those which will cause a delayed effect. The second classification system will be like there are some cold instruments and some are hot instruments. So coming to the immediate effects, the first immediate uh, procedure for a very, very sick patient who comes to casualty with a severe strider and desaturation, you can submit him for a rigid bronchoscopy plus scoring procedure along with a balloon bronchoplasty. Or if you have a laser, that will also give an immediate uh, relief and uh, electrosurgical equipment like the electrosurgical electrode or snaring and organ plasma coagulation. Cryorecanalization also is effective immediately and uh, you can also borrow some micro debriders from your ENT colleagues. Coming to delayed effects, these are Brachytherapy mostly done by the radiation oncology people 
we help them place uh, catheters inside the bronchus to deliver radiation uh, very close to the tumors photodynamic therapy spray cryotherapy and also cryotherapy so coming to cold techniques you have the rigid bronchoscopic coring uh, cryo uh, therapy as well as cryo spray spray cryotherapy and coming to hot techniques you have the laser you have two lasers available now and uh, these are the micro debriders these are the endobronchial shaver equipment from the wolf these are the electrosurgical snare knife as well as the electrocautery electrode and also the apc so i'll describe each technique uh, and also present one case on how we do with each modality so coming to electrocautery, it, we use monopolar probes, uh, we can use snare, knife or forceps. It is a contact mode of thermal ablation. Precautions, you should always use a grounding pad and also make sure that the FAO2 is less than 40. They can interfere with the pacemaker activity and also uh, the success rate in the literature is 90% in malignant patients. So one case example where we use only a electrosurgical snare to remove this tumor. So this is a female patient with extensive metastasis in the chest wall, on the ribs, and also you can see a polyploid growth in the trachea. So it's almost covering uh, two-thirds of the tracheal lumen. So what we do in this patient is loop uh, the electrosurgical snare around the tumor. So somebody should be helping you in putting a loop and you, you, your, uh, your bronchoscopy also should uh, help the assistant to loop around the tumor base. So this can also be done with a flexible bronchoscope if the anesthetist is uh, not available. So first we loop around the tumor. And the base, uh, you don't uh, see much of bleeding here. You can either use an organ plasma coagulation or you can use a cryo just to you know, cryo ablate the base. We use cryo ablation because we don't want to see charring. So the entire tumor has been removed here. This is the pre-procedural uh, tumor and this is the post-procedural tumor. The procedural time is around 5 to 10 minutes in this case. So coming to the next hot technique is laser. We have different types of laser, ND, AG, AP. Mostly we use ND AG lasers. Uh, in the Asian countries, I think in Malaysia and Thailand, they're using AP laser. Uh, AP also has a very good coagulation property, uh, less expensive than the ND AG laser. Again, uh, the most important thing while using lasers is always make sure that you fire parallelly to the tumor, not to, it has got a very uh, high penetration depth. So bleeding and tracheal ruptures are very common. So always start with low powers like 10 to 20. So these are the two uh, lasers available now. This is from uh, KLS Martin and this is from the Loki S. This is an app laser. Coming to um, the BTS guidelines, they also um, say uh, consider uh, laser therapy for uh, patients with interluminal tumors to relieve obstruction. And also the good practice point is that limit the power settings to 40 watts. So this is a case example where uh, laser debulking is done. This is a case where the right uh, complete uh, collapse is there. There is a tumor in the right main bronchus. So first, first suction out and, and uh, try to visualize the mucus of the tumor. Some ideas you get, uh, you have a lot of uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma appearance. and then fire the laser. So once you achieve coagulation and uh, devascularize the tumor, slowly pull out with the rigid forceps. So there are different techniques. So this is the three days after uh, procedure, like you can see complete opening. And coming to the third one, that is organ plasma coagulation, very superficial coagulation with a depth of uh, three to five mm. Um, not a very good technique to use for uh, acute uh, tracheobronchial obstructions because it will take a lot of time to debulk the tumors 
and also when there is a lot of blood when you are debulking the tumor apcs don't work properly so there are two types one is straight firing as well as the side firing probes and there are different modes usually we use forced apc mode and also uh, the guideline says uh, to use these things for tumor debulking when the patients have not uh, having acute critical airway narrowing coming to the cold therapies cryoprobe this is the contact mode what we usually use for transbronchial cryolung biopsies as you all know it works on the joel thompson's effect freezing and thawing cycles co uh, rapidly cools the tissue and then dehydration happens tissue ischemia and cell death by apoptosis the only problem with uh, using cryo alone is like it cannot uh, have a coagulation property like if it starts bleeding you will have to use a balloon or something or an apc to stop the bleeding if you look at maran shuman's uh, literature where she they, again there are two probes in the um, western world they use a lot of uh, rigid uh, cryo probes uh, maran shuman from uh, thorax clinic they have successfully uh, shown that flexible probe also is very useful for cryo debulking with no major complications one case example where i used uh, only cryo uh, to recanalize this uh, this is an young boy like 14 years old patient he has a left upper lobe tumor very soft shiny so after uh, removing with the cry cryo so i was able to recanalize the airway and uh, post obstructive pneumonia was the presentation which relieved completely the the important thing to note here is like if you if you use a lot of electrosurgical instruments like the electrocautery uh, you have a lot of charring and uh, post uh, charring you see some kind of uh, airway becoming more of a pneumonic kind of picture but if you use cryo alone to debulk this tumor you see the softness of the margins so you can appreciate the lof schichel sign here this is the left upper lobe collapse so this is immediately after the post procedure uh, the upper lobe is slowly opening up and simply and this came as a mucus gland adenoma very rare tumor and a few words on uh, spray cryotherapy um, not available in our settings so it's a slow delayed effect coming to rigid bronchoscopic mechanical cloring um if the patient is very symptomatic immediately you want to give an airway then you can try this approach but always anticipate bleeding and also perforation if you are not experienced to do this cold techniques again airway stenting i think uh, professor has dealt um, extensively on this topic so i will skip this coming to bronchoscopic debulking delayed effects you have three main things one is brachytherapy as i told you like you place a radiation catheter close to the tumor and um, usually it is done as uh, one session lasts for 20 to 60 hours complications are like a uh, brachytherapy is used to treat hemoptysis in malignant patients and also uh, there is a lot of literature saying that there is a lot of airway hemorrhage after doing brachytherapy as well and it is not suitable for urgent recanalization for a symptomatic cao coming to photodynamic therapy so first you administer i uh, photosensitizing agent called photofrin and then after 40 uh, to 50 uh, hours of administration you use your flexible bronchoscope use a non thermal laser and then activate near the target site so three sessions are done six weeks apart fob is done after the uh, three days of the first session there is literature also showing that compared with laser there is better clinical response at one month so one experience where i had um, the chance to observe this procedure in national cancer center the so submucosal disease very high t n0 m0 the surgeon wants to take this patient for surgery and then uh, they submit this patient for photodynamic therapy you can see after 3 days the submucosal layer is much better so again they take biopsies assess the depth again they submit him for the second procedure so some case based learning on central airway tumors and tumor debulking so i will now focus on how we deal intraluminal extraluminal as well as mixed case by case first one is intraluminal obstruction this is a 51 year female morbid obese she came from dubai she was referred to me by an ent specialist she was very healthy until march when she started developing wheeze and cough almost 7 to 8 months she was treated as bronchial asthma when she had first seen hemoptysis then she met the ent colleague 
and then they did an indirect laryngoscopy. They found there is a tumor in the trachea and then referred to me. So this is the CT scan of this patient. <coughs> you can see a central uh, tumor here in the proximal trachea, almost occluding the entire tracheal lumen. This is the coronal and sagittal sections. We did a flexible bronchoscopy. And you can see a tumor. In this case, like it looks like a, this tumor has a base and it is moving with inspiration and expiration. But once we started debulking, uh, tried to put a snare around, the base is very broad and we could not um, loop the snare around this tumor. So that becomes complicated. So this is the tube bronchoscopic images. So first what we did is like, uh, uh, we partially uh, used an APC, cryo, all the uh, whatever equipment we have to partially resect. So you can observe some something new in this case, like you have a small ET tube going next to the rigid bronchoscope. Um, and we first what we do is we cryo uh, on the surface all the areas for uh, 3 to 3 minutes sometimes or 3 to 30 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds and then So we freeze and throw on the area like to prevent bleeding and cause some crystallization initially and then go again. So deep inside the tumor we place the cryoprobe and then freeze it there for 1 to 2 minutes and then bring out the tumor like this. So in this case we, we used a small micro laryngeal surgical tube next to the tumor. This is a very proximal tracheal tumor. So if there is a bleeding our anesthetist is very anxiety guy, he doesn't want to take any chances. So we secured the airway using a small micro laryngeal surgical tube which is used by the head and neck surgeons. So it has a very small caliber but the cuff of the tube is of the adult size. So whatever bleeding happens that will go and settle down on the bulb of the ET. So rigid bronchoscopy uh, ha will have like a better control of the airway but not a complete control of the airway. There are cases where patients die on table even with rigid bronchoscopy. So in a private clinical practice it is better to be double sure before doing endobronchial debulking. So this is uh, the tumor what we removed turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma. This is the pre bronchoscopy and the post bronchoscopy pictures. And uh, post bronchoscopy you can see the entire tumor has been removed. She has a nodal metastasis, not operable, subjected to radiation, doing well. And you can see the tracheal lumen now completely opened up. And another case of uh, endoluminal or int intrinsic uh, uh, tumor debulking, 31-year-old female with a growth in the left main uh, bronchus, a small subatlectic uh, segments. Um, asked the surgeon, he wants to do a lobectomy, but I wanted to, uh, because the lo lobe looks healthy, so we got a MPR images done. So again we used only cryo in this case. Again you can see here like uh, we use a small barrel rigid and then uh, ventilate the right. So right is always protected. Whatever happens during the procedure right lung is always protected. And then first put a snare, cut half the tumor. and then the rest of the tumor is removed using cryo. So this is uh, the same day of the procedure. So you go back after uh, a week or so, you can see the smooth margins. So this is where the tumor is arising from. Again you apply cryo for one to two minutes on the base and again take biopsies, send them for histopathology, make sure that uh, the tumor is not there. So you can repeat these cycles again and again. Now the lobe is completely opened up with no residual tumor there. So the third biopsy came out negative. This is just like the surgical margins before the surgeon chooses to operate. And uh, one case of extraluminal or extrinsic obstruction, 35 year old male with a huge growth in the esophagus compressing the trachea presentation with aspiration pneumonia, sorry, but just cough and expectation. So this is the pre bronchoscopic image. Uh, so there is an overall uh, tracheal compression. 
So these are the patients uh, uh, where uh, you can do stenting straight away, extrinsic uh, compression as well as mixed tumors. So here you cannot put a balloon and dilate and try to maintain the patency of the airway. So we put a Taiwang uh, Niti S stent in this patient. So initially the stent was not opening completely. So Taiwang and all the other local stents, whatever are available, they don't open immediately except for the Microtech stents. And then you try to dilate the stent with the balloon. So uh, you can see the pre and post bronchoscopy images. This is the tracheal tumor, the esophageal tumor compressing the trachea and the tracheal lumen is completely open now. Some uh, 3D images. And another case of extralumular intrinsic uh, patient presented uh, acutely with strider, very severe symptomatic patient, almost no lumen, both intrinsic as well as extrinsic component. So beyond this level, again, the airway is clear. So we try to pass small um, balloons and then slowly dilate and then followed by serial rigid dilatation. So whatever we could achieve, I think somebody was asking me how you can assess uh, these kind of lesions. Like if you see here, um, you don't know whether this will open up or not. But metallic stents, the property of metallic stents is that they will restore the patency. Like here, there's a very narrow space to even to send the metallic stent inside. So once you put the metallic stent, so always make sure you measure the distance and now you can see uh, the entire lumen is open. So this is the before and after CT axial images and the coronal images and sagittal images and some 3D pictures where the stent is completely opening up the trachea. You know? So this microtech, uh, they open very fast immediately after the procedure, you don't need to wait. And uh, one very interesting case last uh, week I had, uh, this patient, 54 year old female, she was treated for a tracheal tumor, uh, some metastasis, pericardial effusion, pleural effusion and all. And then they did a tracheostomy uh, because they didn't want to refer to an interventional pulmonologist at that time. After six months, the tumor grows into the tracheostomy tube and pushes out the tracheostomy tube. So she has no air to breathe. I didn't get the video because it is too big. So it took me around 4-5 hours to, so here like uh, only a 9mm uh, rigid scope is going through this and if I remove this uh, tracheostomy tube, I, I was not able, the anesthetist was not able to ventilate. So we put the tracheostomy tube at the surface, used a flexible bronchoscope as the camera and then below the tracheostomy we passed a small rigid scope and slowly debulked. First tried to uh, debulk the tumor in the lower part. So ideal case for Y stenting, but I didn't have a Y, patient was very sick on table. So we had to put a stent in the lower trachea followed by a left main stenting because left main is also completely involved. So another case, uh, uh, not only tumors, sometimes you see post radiation um, tracheal stenosis, 50 year old female post record malignancy received twice radiation, then presenting with uh, cough and SOB grade 3 stenosis uh, cotton mayors. So this is the video. So you can see the circumferential stenosis. Like surgeon, since she, this is a patient with radiation, they don't want to take up for surgery. So no um, electrocautery or balloon. I just use the rigid scope to pass beyond the tumor, beyond the stenosis. So two or three cycles and then I was very successful in uh, curing out the stenosis. I, we can even avoid stenting. I think complete luminal patency is achieved in this patient. I am uh, not using mitomycin or something. Dr. Jamal, I think he has a lot of experience on that. This X-ray. So some complications uh, uh, like if your anesthetist is not um, fully conscious of what or you are doing procedure for a longer time. Uh, he's fed up with you like he tries to put your FiO2 at 100 uh, even though you're using some electrosurgical instrument. This is the same tracheal tumor case I was talking about. The lady through the tracheal, you can see the airway fire there. So always be cautious about this complication. The activation was only for one, two seconds. Still you, you can see luckily the, air, uh, the fire got uh, uh, relieved by itself. So first when you're dealing with a symptomatic malignant central airway obstruction, see whether there is an endoluminal component or extraluminal component. If it is endoluminal, 
make sure whether the patient needs an immediate effect or a delayed effect and then based on that your therapy will vary and extraluminal component there is nothing you can do dilate and put a stent straight away so coming to the technical success rate they say reopening the lumen to more than 50 percent of normal and the acquire registry shows that uh, 93 percent of the uh, patients had technical success and also 48 and 42 in terms of dyspnea and quality of life even there are some studies comparing uh, though there is no survival benefit but definitely there is improvement in quality of life as well as dyspnea scales so this mls approach which i myself has uh, so there are some uh, multi intubation techniques in the literature so with the problem with the nst i started using this technique and uh, i'm very successful in doing cases we have done around 7 8 cases like this and we have sent it for the european congress in um, i think it's uh, somewhere it's coming up in may and uh, take home message is uh, procedural competency first uh, do no harm to the patient since your colleagues are doing you want to do rigidoscopy that doesn't work you have to get trained and then get a certification because these are the recommendations by various societies after so much of experience and teamwork thank you so any questions any questions about this approach with the rigid bronchoscope and you're putting a uh, mi micro labial surgical tube. So yeah. what is the tube called? MLS tube. And it is passed along the bronchoscope, uh, outside. So, outside. So you first, the anesthetist, or you first put that tube, yeah. like a normal intubation under GA, mm -hmm. and then you slide the bronchoscope to the cords. Yes. So the size of the bronchoscope would be smaller, generally? Yeah, two, two times smaller than what, the, what we use. What? Two barrels smaller. And what is the size of this uh, diameter of this? 4 mm. It comes in 4 and 5. 5 will go till the bronchi. 4 will go only till the uh, carinal level. Okay. And it's got a cuff? And it's it has a cuff with uh, the adult uh, size. Okay. And it's not, uh, it's not got a metallic wall. It's just no, no, not plastic. No, no, it's a plastic one. Thank you, Dr. Hari Krishna. Well, uh, nice lecture about this. With this, we come to the end of this session. Uh, now, I would uh, request our chairpersons to kindly felicitate uh, our speakers first. Dr. Anand Mohan, sir, kindly come on the stage. I would like to call Dr. Pratibha to come on stage and felicitate uh, Professor Abzal Anis.
Now I would like to call uh, Dr. Shami Mukhtar to come on stage and felicitate uh, Professor R. Bhargav. We end today's session and we will uh, regather here after lunch for the hands on training session uh, at uh, 2.30 p.m.